Okay. So, I think it started the recording, though I can't see it moving. No, it is recording. I can see it here. Uh, but normally what happens with the recording thing, there is a number, like it adds up the time, but it's not clicking the clock. <laughs> I think because I see the red dot. It's oh. So, Namaste Shashikanji. Namaste. Namaste. And, uh, Hardika Swagatam for this course. Dhaniwad. Like I just told you, history of science and technology in ancient India. And I'd like to introduce you to the to our students. So Shashikanji, the big connection he has with KGP and with all of you is that he's a senior. He's an alumnus from this uh, institute. And um, after that, he's gone on to, he went on and did a, achieved a lot of things in the US with the big data sets and, you know, helping a lot of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, so Shashiji is amused that I've done a little bit of homework. <laughs> <laughs> achieve greater heights but uh, the connection between such shashiji and me is the fact that we uh, we both have a passion for sanskrit and uh, there are in fact he and a certain team of them have also developed a font uh, different kinds of fonts and uh, the conversion programs from in roman script to devanagari and to transliteration etc uh, called the itrans uh, font, yeah. and besides that, they've done a work of compiling Sanskrit documents, etc. But I think one of the biggest, uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, specializations that he has is to be able to present the knowledge within, so the rich uh, wisdom that is there in the Sanskrit literature as practical Sanskrit. He's able to make that bridge between that knowledge tradition and presenting it with its relevance in our daily context. So today I have requested him because he had also spoken to us earlier on about, and he's a nice article also on ancient Indian mathematics. It's the, what you've been looking at the last two days. So maybe you'd like to just tell Shashikanji what you have. Um, yes, sure, sure. So um, I did my uh, bachelor's in computer science in 1990. So that way I'm a dinosaur, but still uh, alive, not extinct. So my uh, interest in Sanskrit started in school and continued a little later. But uh, uh, what I mainly found was that uh, because any deeper study in Sanskrit literature of any kind, any field is completely missing from schools, we really don't uh, know what all is there. And uh, it is changing a little bit now. Uh, it was in common knowledge in, in educational circles, say, even till 60s and 70s, and then suddenly it just disappeared. We never talked about our own scientific achievements. And now, apparently, it is coming up uh, for good and bad reasons. Uh, so what I uh, do is, uh, especially in this one, I mean, most of the information uh, is available online. Uh, actually, all of them is available online. Now, even books are available through archive.org so there's nothing uh, i'm providing new but there's one thing i'm providing new is how to see the whole scenario how to connect the dots so that is something i'll be uh, providing new this was uh, also five years back i had done some uh, research for uh, some article and uh, it was a uh, surprise for me also to realize uh, something great missing in the picture uh, that we keep telling about uh, indian mathematics or world mathematics. So I think I will start now because uh, <laughs> I've been told there's limited time and uh, I usually get carried away. But uh, once again, I'll try to stick to imparting the passion uh, for these studies. Uh, I don't know how many of you would have the interest or time or aptitude, but that's up to you. So let me just get started now. So most of the facts are available on the internet, as I mentioned, and uh, it's again also very important to connect the dots. So uh, if you don't connect the dots, you just have data. When you connect the dots, then you get some uh, insight and uh, and some wisdom, right? And uh, the examples I'm giving are the most notable examples. There is a lot out there uh, that will also require uh, maths department people uh, to be able to digest that. Uh, there's a lot of lot of stuff. So I'm not going to go into all of them in this short introductory thing. The purpose here would be also to one to know the truth. 
Uh, second, to have some self-respect and pride and awe at the great wisdom of this land uh, to which uh, we are uh, inhabitant. So it doesn't matter whatever uh, thinking or faith or belief or whatever are, uh, the people of this land have done great stuff. And we should know. I mean, we know more about Greeks and Romans than uh, Indians, right? So let us start with some examples. And uh, right up front, uh, the whole thing is summarized in one sentence is the standard of evidence required to claim transmission of knowledge from east to west is greater than the standard of evidence required for the knowledge from west to east. I'll give you one short example. There was, I think a couple of years back, there was an uh, article, uh, it says that uh, zero was invented in Mesopotamia. And when you look at it uh, in the article, it just says that, you know, there are some spaces left blank. There's not even a symbol, it was left blank. And that suggests that they must have known zero. So there are all, all kinds of attempts, uh, quite a few very flimsy to say that no, no, everything was there in the West. And then uh, when it comes to India, they'll say, okay, where is the written proof? And not realizing that for a long, long, long time, everything was uh, oral transmission in India, especially the weather uh, does not even allow uh, manuscripts to be saved over centuries, right? So you cannot ignore the oral tradition. But anyway, let's get into uh, the interesting things. So, um, you can find most of the things uh, in uh, St. Andrew's uh, website. It's a UK uh, university, a beautiful University of St. Andrew's. And there are a lot of Indian mathematicians. Some of them we have heard, uh, some we don't. And uh, we'll see a few of them. So the most popular uh, contribution of India is the place value system and zero. So let's just get that out of the way right away. So the Greeks uh, did geometry. Uh, even numbers were lengths of ropes for them. So they did not actually have arithmetic, right? They, they did numbers in, in terms of lengths, not in terms of numbers. And uh, in India, the geometry uh, was uh, inspired by uh, the Vedic, Yajna uh, Vedika construction. So different kinds of uh, altars, designs were made. And today we might say, why this, why that, and it's all religion or whatever. But the important point is, for whatever reason, they said, I want this kind of design for this particular yagna, that kind of design for that. And these could have been something, you know, trade secret that, you know, I only know how to construct this altar. I'm just guessing here. But whatever it was, it led to, to mathematical uh, and geometrical and uh, number wise, uh, like arithmetic and algebra, as well as geometry. So it led to that uh, requirement. I mean, we know that uh, calendars were standardized much later. Uh, when uh, in Europe they found that they could not predict when is the uh, the festival supposed to be or the harvest festival supposed to be. And it was a big mess for centuries. And then they said, we need to get good at this calendar. Compass uh, navigation became very important. And uh, when, when people were going all across the continents, across the seas, so that led to uh, other uh, developments. So it's like the, you know, the necessity is the mother of invention. So they had that necessity. Uh, large numbers have been used from very, very early on. This is very important. Uh, if you look at the Romans, uh, the largest numbers have uh, only a few thousand. You know, uh, the, the M for millennia is actually a thousand. So today millennium is a, a, a million, but uh, it's actually just a thousand. Uh, imagine doing maths or calculus or logarithms, space programs with the Roman numerals. And here is the, the logarithmic table. I'm sure none of you know it because it's out of syllabus now, but uh, this was used by us even during JE exam. And this actually lets you do some crazy uh, uh, multiplications and uh, you can find some roots or whatever. Ramayan has uh, names uh, for numbers as high as 10 power 55, uh, and it occurs in Yudhakanda, Sarg 28, when uh, Ravan has sent a spy. Uh, to to find out about the enemy, uh, which is in this case Ravan. He has crossed and his army is uh, right out there. And uh, the spy comes back and says that, uh, you see that guy? That guy is the one who came back earlier and uh, destroyed, uh, you know, burnt our Lanka. You see that guy? That guy is his brother. You see that guy? That guy is the commander in chief and all that stuff. And then he mentions uh, these names. And uh, all these names are basically starting from 100 and then um, 100,000 and then uh, uh, that is Laksha, then 100 crores, uh, 100 lakhs is a crore like that. It keeps going uh, all the way till 10 power 55. 
Fibonacci was uh, the first one to promote Indian place value system uh, and the number system with uh, 10 digits, uh, 10 symbols to Europe, but he was completely ignored uh, for three centuries. And just to get an importance of this number, uh, this, uh, this contribution, Laplace uh, says that the ingenious method of expressing every possible number using a set of 10 symbols emerged in India. The idea seems so simple nowadays. This is uh, you know, maybe around 1800s, right? Uh, 1749, he was born. Uh, so it seems so uh, simple nowadays that its significance and profound importance is no longer appreciated. Its simplicity lies in the way it facilitated calculation and placed arithmetic foremost among useful inventions. The importance of this invention is more readily appreciated when one considers that it was beyond the two greatest men of antiquity, Archimedes and Apollonius. So they hold Archimedes uh, and Euclid and Pythagoras very, very highly. I don't know how many uh, Indian mathematicians we hold highly in regard, right? <coughs> anyway, so let's come to some interesting uh, problems. So one of the problem is uh, what should be the values of currency notes or coins so that using each uh, one only once you can make the sum of all numbers within the range. So, for example, today we have uh, currency notes for 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50 and 100. Can we measure all the numbers up to 100 and actually up to 170 or something using a single note of each kind? So you have only one 100 rupee note, 150 rupee note, 120 rupee note, 110 rupee, 5 rupee, 2 rupee, 1 rupee notes like that, right? Can you, uh, if, if you go shopping, can you uh, give any particular price, uh, for example, 91? Can you make 91 out of them? So it is 50 plus 20 plus 10, that's 80. And then the maximum you can get is 88. You cannot make 91, right? Simple question. And you would say, what's the big deal? And the big deal is, well, you want to minimize the number of coins or uh, notes that you print, right? And this could also apply to weights. So for example, in the uh, earlier days, you had uh, handheld beam balance, so to speak, right? And you had this uh, 5 gram or uh, 50 gram, 100 gram, like these weights. And then you have to measure your uh, sub G or whatever. And then uh, you need multiple of those, right? So if you use the binary numbers, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64, then you can actually make up every number from 1 to 127. And this is a very simple uh, thing that in, in computer science, people will immediately get it that this is just powers of 2. And that's how all the bits and bytes work. But what is the big deal about this? So this is uh, our uh, ANA system, the, the old rupee. So now we say uh, the, the new paisa is what used to be called after 1957, I think. That's when the new decimal system came in the uh, currency one. But before that, we had ANA. So um, So we had 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64 anas. 64 anas would make 1 rupee, right? And uh, there's a saying in Hindi, sola ane such. Sola ane such means it is 100% true. Why did sola ane such, right? Mm. So, so that is because the sola is, uh, makes 1 uh, rupee, which is 100%, which makes a full rupee, right? And the words we have chavanni and athanni, chavanni is char ana, which is 25 paise. Why is that? Char ana is 4 into 4, which is 16, and which is one fourth of a rupee, right? So imagine that we had the system, uh, the 64 based, not 60 based, not uh, 100 based, not 50 based, 64 based. And it's not coincidence, right? We, we might say, though, it's just a coincidence, whatever. It never happened anywhere else. And interestingly, this uh, goes all the way back to Harappa. So 500 BCE, that is about 7,000. Uh, 20 years back, uh, Harappa had standardized weights and measures in the Indus Valley civilization. And uh, 558 weights have been excavated from Mohenjo-daro. So different stones with different weights and all, they have been excavated, about 558 different ones, right? The bricks for which Indus Valley civilization was very famous, uh, very, very famous. Uh, they were the first ones to actually make bricks. They had a standardized brick uh, of 1 is to 2 is to 4 ratio. So 1 is the width uh, and uh, thickness, 2 is the width, and 4 is the length. And this standardization uh, is a sign of 
great commerce. Uh, that's what happens uh, in every uh, civilization, that as soon as you have start uh, money, you trade with different people, mm -hmm. you need some standardization so that there's no cheating going on or whatever. So they've also found an ivory ruler in the Lothal. Uh, this goes back to 2400 BCE, which has the smallest marking is 1.6 millimeter calibration. And uh, the variation is uh, almost negligible. There is no variation. It's very, very standardized, very precise measurement. And standardization, as I mentioned, is the sign of a flourishing uh, commerce. And remember that Indus Valley was doing commerce uh, all over uh, Middle East and uh, Europe, uh, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and uh, the Greeks. And uh, well, Greeks were not there at that time, but uh, all of the uh, the known world at that time they were trading. We do find uh, archaeological excavations, seals, Indus seals. Did somebody mute their uh, microphone? It's a lot of noise. Okay. The Arthashastra by Chanakya also offers a lot of wealth of evidence for the wide varieties of standardized weights and measures of the time, right? And there was actually a department of standardization and they would actually catch if somebody was using false weights or things like that and that would be penalized. Now let's look at one more person, uh, Pingala. Uh, so let me just first introduce the problem. Uh, or the, the problem solution. So here is uh, Pingala's Chanda uh, Shastra. Uh, very, very opening uh, this thing he's saying, Varasaya Kaguhara Vasudhasa. And what he's trying to do here is, uh, when you have, uh, you know, in Sanskrit, and actually in every language, you have a short and a long vowel. So when you are saying some uh, words, uh, there is short and long, and uh, patterns of short and long vowels. Consonants are just there to give a color to the, uh, to the vowel sound, but otherwise it's the vowels that sustain it, right? So short and long. So when you're making poetry, I mean, uh, we have uh, blank verses and all nowadays, but in Sanskrit, uh, chanda actually means that which is pleasing. So poetry or music uh, is very pleasing, so it's called chandas. And uh, here what he's doing is he's trying to make patterns of three uh, varna, uh, varna is syllable, or three notes, and uh, he's saying, uh, what are the various combinations possible, permutations uh, possible, of uh, one short and one long vowel. So varasaya, and then he's giving the name to that particular pattern. So varasa, and why they're using like this? This is a very typical thing in Sanskrit. They don't use uh, very boring stuff. They try to make it interesting. So they're saying varasaya is, va is a short vowel, ra and sa are long vowel, and ya at the end is the name of that. So it is a ya gana, and the yagana is what? One, uh, two, two. That is short, long, long. And that you see here in the bracket, but uh, uh, it is not ISS. It is <laughs> the bar is for a short uh, matra and the S like uh, symbol avagraha is uh, for the long matra. The next one is kaguhara is the ra gana. And uh, the, the pattern to remember is uh, ka gu ha. So long, short, long. Vasudhasa is uh, short, short, long. So like that, they have eight, uh, so this is Sargon. So there are eight Ganas, and uh, they just took the number three there. So let's look at what is going on here. So Chandas, as we mentioned, that uh, Chanda itself means something that is pleasing, and uh, Chanda Shastra is uh, the Shastra of uh, prosody or poetry or meters. And uh, Pingala was born around uh, 3rd century uh, BCE, and uh, his work is in a sutra style, even though it is called Shastra, it is in a sutra style. Uh, and Halayudha is another person who gives a commentary on it in the 10th century. That is one of the commentaries that is available. So all the sutra style uh, literature uh, is very, very compact uh, thing. It's not like detailed lecture notes. It is just the headlines uh, kind of thing uh, or just the formula and no derivation. So the derivations would be in some commentaries or discussed in the class. That is why a lot of times you find that, you know, oh, it's so cryptic. I don't know whether they knew it or not or whatever. You're just extrapolating, things like that. Because sutra is by uh, nature is supposed to be very uh, precise and uh, to the point and very, very uh, short and concise. So the two values of a short and a long vowel, uh, if a verse or a chanda has n syllables, right? N syllable. And syllable is, uh, it ends in a vowel. So whenever the vowel comes, that, that ends one syllable. So per line, if you have n syllables, how many types of patterns can be made? 
So, for example, the common, very common shlok uh, that we hear is an Anushtup Chanda, which has 8888. Eight, eight, eight. Uh, so, two lines, uh, and if you divide each line into, that is four pieces, each piece has eight syllables. So, the question might be that how many types of um, Anushtup Chand can be there uh, because that uh, uh, the Varna Vritta is uh, length is 16 for one line, right? So, total possible combinations for any value of n will be 2 to the power n. And again, this is now very obvious uh, to us. It was not uh, that obvious uh, thinking of not just 2, but the powers and then calculating how many. This is all combinatorics, right? Computation, uh, uh, combination permutation. So, we see that there are 8 possible for uh, n equal to 3, right? And these 8 are actually given names, and these are the common pieces that are used to com uh, compose bigger um, this uh, verse pattern, this classification. Now, if, in, if it is 16, it will be 2 to the power 16 possible variations, but not everything is uh, beautiful uh, to the ear. Same thing with the musical raga. Uh, a raga would have, you know, basically seven main notes and 12 total notes and then 22 shrutis totally. If you look at Indian system, there's 22 shrutis. So you could say that, you know, even if you take 12, uh, how many different ways can you make a raga? So it will be, you know, how many are you picking? You're picking five, then 12 C5, right? Uh, how many ways can you pick? Uh, 12 P5, actually, permutations. So not all permutations are actually music because music is that which pleases the ear. Music is not any sound, right? So even though the, the, the possibilities are very, very high in trillions and all, but the number of actual ragas are only very less uh, compared to that. A few hundreds are the most popular and then thousands of so have actually given names to that. So this one, <clears throat> this one is a Pascal Strangle. It's called Meru Prastar. And uh, Donald Nuth, uh, he's the father of computing, in The Art of Computer Programming, he mentions that. That Halayud, in his uh, commentary uh, on Pingala's work, mentions uh, this. And uh, he had actually, uh, in his books, he says, if there's any kind of error, I'll give you $2, even including typographical error. So he, he didn't even make a you know, spelling mistake. So there he had mentioned historical. And I said, OK, the very first chapter only, I said, this, he will miss it. And then I find that he has mentioned that. So it's a very well known even in the 60s uh, and all. And this is also a binary system because, uh, you know, when you're doing uh, the gana, the short and long, uh, there are only two values. And similarly, in binary numbers, there's only zero and one. So there's a clear uh, you know, development of uh, binary numbers. He even shows how to convert a given sequence number. Like, you know, the, if it is the fifth one, then how do you convert it into the pattern and all? He mentions that, which is basically division in binary systems. And these are also coefficients of NCR. So what you see on the left side is the Meru Prastha. He also uh, mentions of Matra Meru, which is uh, Fibonacci uh, sequence. And he explicitly mentions uh, zero, uh, Shunya, in the process of you know, how to convert a number into binary pattern. I also want to give you a quick uh, short story. Uh, and I think stories are very interesting. So this is about parallel universes. And uh, the known universe is uh, inside a black hole. This is the presumption. What if the entire known universe we have today is inside a black hole and there are many such black hole bubbles? And uh, because uh, light cannot uh, get out of a black hole, none of these big, huge black hole bubbles can communicate with each other, right? You cannot prove it or disprove it, but this has been postulated, right? And they're saying that, you know, there is a possibility of uh, parallel universes because you can't even disprove it. So, <clears throat> here's a story uh, in one of the Puran, uh, Brahma Vaivartha Puran. And in this, uh, it comes uh, that Indra, uh, he defeats uh, Vritra. And uh, after that, he gets uh, very proud that I could defeat uh, the Asura Vritta. And uh, he wants to remember this. So, he calls the celestial engineer Vishwakarma and says, uh, we need to build a great palace. And uh, he would visit the palace while under construction and he will see, the, oh, okay, can we make this change? Can we make that change? And he was basically making, uh, you know, design requirement changes in the middle of the project, right? So it's not possible. So Vishwakarma goes to uh, Brahma and says, uh, this guy is just driving me crazy. I've not had any leaves and, uh, you know, I'm constantly working what to do. And uh, Brahma says, let's go to Vishnu. He will have some insights. So Vishnu realizes the the 
the root problem is Indra's pride. So he says, okay, you go, I'll take care. And uh, the next day when uh, Indra is uh, in his, uh, he's moved in, by the way, in the palace, and uh, he's still making changes you know, on the upper floors and things like that. So uh, the doorkeeper comes and says, sir, there is some uh, young Brahmin boy who has uh, come to see you. So he's a brahmachari, you know, students who would live in an ashram. So he calls him in and says, uh, great, you know, uh, have uh, some food and all. Please accept my hospitality. And uh, he gives him a nasan and sits down and, you know, he's, uh, the kid is having food. And he says, okay, how is everything you know, at, the, at your home, at the Gurukul? How is your studies going? All this you know, small talk is happening. And uh, then uh, um, the boy says, looks around and says, uh, I heard a lot of things about your um, palace and uh, no other Indra previously has been able to achieve this feat of this great uh, architecture. So Indra is kind of little like, what do you mean like no other previous Indra, right? And uh, then uh, he sees, uh, this boy sees a small uh, you know, line of ants moving by. And he looks at that and he laughs and then suppresses his laughter. And uh, Indra is very disturbed and says, why are you laughing? And uh, the kid says, it's better if you don't know the reason for my laughter. And that makes Indra very, very suspicious and very uh, scared. And he says, please tell me why, why you're laughing. So he says, all these ants that you see, they were Indras in previous uh, births. But because of their pride, they've all become ants now. So now Indra is very, very uh, scared that this is not an ordinary kid. You know, he, he already has a very you know, uh, luminous face and uh, he looks young, but he's not young. He's very wise and all. So he's thinking all this and the gatekeeper comes again, says there is a saint, uh, sage, ascetic. Uh, he has also come to visit you. He says, okay, bring him in. And then he says, okay, who are you? What's uh, up with you? He says, the sage says, the saint says, the ascetic, uh, that my name is Lomash and uh, he has a uh, big patch of hair on his chest and a perfect circle right in the middle of the hair, uh, the, the forest of hair that he has on his chest, there's a perfect circle, no hair. So it's like very curious, you know, so this is, who are you? What's up with you? So he says, my name is Lomash and uh, this is uh, uh, what you call, uh, with every Indra, uh, one hair of my uh, chest falls down. And uh, that's the reason I don't have uh, any family and I'm least interested in all these things. So now uh, Indra says, okay, I give up. Who are you guys? And then uh, the boy turns into Vishnu and uh, the, the ascetic turns into Shiva. And then Vishnu says something that um, you are not the only uh, Indra and there's not only uh, one Vishnu and one Shiva. There are multiple simultaneous universes Srishti with their own Shiva, Vishnu and uh, Brahma and their own series of Indra. So this uh, is uh, where this passing remark about multiple uh, universes comes. And he says, and who will search through the wide infinite of space to count the universe side by side, each containing its own Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, right? This comes from Brahma Vaivarta Purana. And interestingly, uh, in uh, 300 BCE, Bhadrabahu, a giant mathematician, discusses five types of infinity. Uh, a, a ray, a line, which is two-dimensional, a volume, and then a perpetual, and he even deals with numbers as high as 10 power 207. The American theoretical physicist, Brian Greene, uh, he's written a wonderful book, The Elegant Universe. Uh, in another of his book, he mentions about nine different types of infinities or multiverses, uh, nine different multiverses, quilted, inflationary, brain, cyclic. You can read these up and uh, they will not make any sense to us. Uh, maybe when you go into astronomy or something, it might make. There's another one called uh, Purnamadha Purnamidam Purnat Purnamadachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Avashishyate which basically is talking about infinity. And you can say, oh, why it is talking about infinity? This is just some religious or spiritual thing or whatever. But even then, there is nobody in the world who has said something like this, even for their own supreme power, that, you know, if you take infinite from infinite or from complete, if you take complete from complete, only complete remains. So that which is complete is complete. Right? So an interesting thing also is one to infinity is the outer world. One to zero is the inner world. And whatever is there from one to infinity, if you take the reciprocal, you get a number from zero to one. Right. 
So there's a one-to-one -one mapping of everything outside to everything inside. And there's a very interesting uh, side effect to this, that whatever we know or whatever we discover or invent actually comes from inside because the events always are happening outside, right? Uh, even before Newton, gravity was working. Even before Newton, apples were falling. So the observation was always there. But what clicked in Newton's mind came from his own mind. That's the beauty, right? So everything that is newly created is already there in your mind. You just have to be picked and matched. Anyway, so let's uh, have a quick uh, background. Um, and this is where I think it's, very, and I'll take some more examples later on also, but this is an important part I want to cover. So the history of maths is, you know, it's very vast and will never be complete. And a lot of things uh, are undiscovered, a lot of written proofs uh, are lost forever. A lot of uh, civilizations didn't even have written proofs, right? So it's not possible that we'll get a complete picture ever. And uh, the question again is, did India do anything more than the zero and the place value and the infinity? These are the standard things, you know, we gave infinite, zero and uh, decimal system. So how could a poor religious Hindu India, a third world country produce anything substantial is the standard logic or the standard refrain that comes to mind today, today, right? Not before. And uh, the interesting thing is India was never poor. It has a long history of trade. And the reason uh, America was discovered was that people were trying to look for India. So you don't go around looking for poor countries. Uh, you go and look for the rich countries, right? Like everybody wants to go to US today. Everybody wanted to come to India at that time. And uh, the so-called religion, uh, whatever, the faith of the people was in harmony with the science all along. So it is very possible to have, uh, you know, the two supporting each other. Now, the continuity of scientific temperament and progress in this land is an interesting thing. 6,500 BCE, almost uh, 9,000 years before, in Mehergad, in Harappan civilization, we find 11 drilled molar crowns or proto-dentistry in an early farming culture. Now, if there is a root canal, uh, root canal done, that means uh, sugar is there because you don't find animals having that kind of requirements, which means that sugar was there. And sugar, which is available in nature, is not causing any tooth decay. The one that is extracted from sugar cane is the one that causes problems. So, which means that 8,500 years ago, that civilization, uh, Harappan civilization, not 2,000 years uh, BCE, 6,500 BCE, they were already a great agrarian culture. They had settled, they had a lot of time, they had extracted sugar, they were addicted to sugar, they had a sweet tooth, they got tooth problem, and then they tried to do something about it also by trying to do some drilling and all, right? Just one little thing can give you a lot of inferences. And then we saw that in Indus Valley, the standardization of weights and uh, measures were there, binary numbers were used, uh, obviously renowned uh, town planning and advanced metallurgy. So in 1968 uh, to 96, there was another excavation done in Mehergad and uh, Noshara and Pirak. And uh, it has been, uh, and this was done by uh, some French people. Uh, so they have established that there was a continuous living, continuous sequence of dwelling sites from 7000 BC to 500 BC. And after 500, we already know what, what, all our history. Right? So this is also something important to keep in uh, mind. Now, once you connect the dots, it's not difficult to imagine that, you know, uh, the, the same scientific pursuit continued the, the pursuit to knowledge, right? When you see that in Indus Valley, we already had the standardization of weights, binary systems. Then you have Bodhayan in 800 BC, we'll see this later, uh, who uh, gave proofs also for Pythagoras theorem. Pythagoras theorem was known to almost all civilizations, but still we gave one name from a Greek guy who was not even a mathematician, by the way, we'll see that. Pingala in 300 BC is doing combinations, Aryabhatta in 419 C is doing trigonometry and a lot more, uh, you know, higher uh, mathematics. Madhava in 1400 is uh, discovering calculus, right? So there's a continuity and this is just samples, right? There's continuously something or the other is happening. So the question is, does it make any difference now whether we know it was Pythagoras or Bodhaya and what, what's the big deal? You know, it's uh, not the greatest of uh, things. It's so common knowledge. It's there everywhere. Uh, but if it doesn't make a difference, why call it Pythagoras theorem or Euclid's geometry or Newton's powers? Why have we given the names, right? So why should we not have an inspiration from our past? Just as a matter of fact, you know, you don't have to be proud and all, chest thumping is not required, but we should at least get inspiration that we also were able to do. And why should these names not become household names? Aryabhatta has become a household name, but not the whole, whole set of this, right? So the first step towards that would be that we only we understand, realize, and appreciate how our ancestors pursued knowledge. 
So there is a Eurocentric view. And uh, uh, in the Eurocentric view, the ancient Greeks are the epitome of logic, scientific temperament, and mathematical achievement. Because they, when they wrote their history, they said that our guys were greatest. And uh, we also took their statement saying that their guy is the greatest. I mean, that's a little... So the Pythagoras and Euclid are the most famous names from the ancient uh, mathematical world we see. And I'm not going to go into detail, but I've just got some screenshots from, uh, from Wiki, Wikipedia, which gives you an idea of how certain these historical figures were. No authentic writings of Pythagoras have survived, right? And more, almost nothing is known for certain about his life. The earliest source on Pythagoras' life and brief, uh, ambiguous and often satirical. And we take that, you know, okay, Western accounts of history are foolproof, right? That's what we think, that we know exactly everything about the Greek and Roman things. But nothing is known about Pythagoras. Uh, most of the major sources on Pythagoras' life and from uh, are from the Roman period. Can you imagine that 500, 600, 700 years later, somebody is writing, and that we take as history. By which point, according to the German classicist, the history of Pythagoreanism was already the laborious reconstruction of something lost and gone. Right? So it is not very, very uh, you know, foolproof that this is what happened. About Euclid, very few original references to Euclid survive, so little is known about his life. Right, And he is supposed to be around 300 BCE, whereas Sulva Sutra is 800 BCE uh, by Bodhain. We'll see that one. A detailed biography of Euclid is given by Arabian authors, not even Roman, mentioning, for example, a birth town of Tyre. This biography is generally believed to be fictitious. So there goes our you know, rock-solid historical knowledge about uh, Pythagoras and uh, Euclid. And uh, in Euclid, uh, one of Euclid's accomplishment was to present them in a single logical coherent framework. So, uh, although many of the results in elements originated with earlier mathematicians, so Euclid did not invent geometry. He was a great compiler and great teacher of geometry, and he supplied a lot of proofs, right? But it was not that he invented whatever he said in elements. That's very important to remember. So now let's connect the dots. How can we say that Indian mathematicians actually had an impact? That also on uh, the world uh, mathematical uh, this thing. How can we say that? Uh, zero and decimal system, let's go beyond that. So we can look at some veri verifiable facts from history. Uh, and I've picked up these dates uh, from uh, the internet of reputed uh, colleges that say that uh, what is the timeline of uh, mathematical discoveries. So prior to 800 BCE, we have evidence that mainly Mesopotamian and Egyptian mathematicians uh, in the Western Hemisphere, Indus Valley in the uh, in the, this side of the world, of the Indian side of the world. 800 BCE, Bodhayan uh, Sulva Sutra. There are six other sutras also, but Sulva Sutra uh, is uh, mentions uh, the Pythagorean theorem and it gives uh, proofs also, calculation of square root of two accurately done to five decimal places. And interesting is to how they arrived at or calculated the square root of two and uh, or, or the square root method also is very interesting. Geometrical construction is also there. 575 BC, Thales uh, brings Babylonian knowledge to Greece and then the Greek awakening starts, right? So 500 uh, BC, the Greek awakening is starting, 600 BC almost. 300 BC, Bhadravahu, we saw that he talks about five uh, types of infinities. When you talk about five types of infinities, imagine the, uh, the the previous work that has gone. I mean, first of all, you have to grapple with infinity. Then you can only think of five infinities. And then grappling with infinity, you have to be able to think of huge numbers, right? So you don't find any of these thoughts anywhere else because they could not think of large numbers, right? Then uh, 230 BCE, uh, Eratosthenes of uh, Cyrene, he develops the sieve method of finding all prime numbers. Right. So basically you keep going and whenever you find a prime number, if you take two, then every uh, two, four, six, eight, you just keep removing that these are not prime numbers. Then take three and then three, six, nine, uh, 12, 15, you just remove them. That's the sieve method. After that, there's no major work, new work comes out of Greece or Europe except for commentaries on existing stuff. Right? The dark ages of Europe also coincide with this period. This is when the dark ages also start happening. 1202 Fibonacci writes his uh, Liber Abaci or the Book of Abacus and uh, he updates that in 1254 uh, and uh, you know sets out uh, arithmetic and algebra he learnt in Arab and, uh, Arabia and Persia. And he introduces the, the Indian uh, number system of using uh, nine digits, right? And uh, nobody uh, you know picks it up. I mean, they're all, all proud of the Roman heritage 
and uh, nobody even bothers about the system. And uh, after a few centuries, they pick it up. 1572, Bombelli gives the first new contribution of uh, this uh, complex numbers. So between uh, 230 BCE to 1572, almost 18 centuries, there's nothing original coming out of Europe, nothing. So one, why nothing original came out? And then why all of a sudden from uh, 17th century, we see hundreds of new mathematicians in Europe? That's something that we should think, that for 18 centuries, nothing. And then all of a sudden, everything, right? So what was happening outside of Europe during this time? First century BC, in Lalita Vistar, it mentions that Buddha enumerates uh, to a mathematician called Arjun, uh, powers of 100. So he goes from uh, 10, uh, power of 10, goes from 10 power 7 to 10 power 53. And we saw that Ramayana also has uh, up to 10 power 53 uh, names given to them, right? Not just, uh, okay, whatever. Then Buddha goes up to 10 power 421, giving names to these numbers. And you give names only when you're familiar with something, right? You use them uh, on a regular basis, only then you give them names. In 499, Aryabhatta of Kusumpura, which is uh, Patiputra, today's Patna, he composes Aryabhatiya and gives uh, the great values, uh, best values of pi known at that time to five decimal places. A lot of other contributions that are there, which is very well known, so I'm not including the details here. Uh, he gives trigonometric tables accurate to 0.03%, gives formula for calculating the sign for intermediate angles, develops uh, word numbers, uh, numerals, word numerals, uh, or Kuttak method also he develops. Katapayadi is the word numerals, where you use letters to denote numbers. And the reason for that is that when you are writing uh, in, in a language like Sanskrit and Shlok and all that stuff, all of a sudden you don't have big numbers coming in that will break the flow of poetry, right? So, so he brings in uh, letters to substitute for numbers. Great uh, work he does. Then 628, Brahma Gupta composes, uh, Brahma Sputa Siddhanta uses zero negative numbers, solves the so-called Pell's equation which will come in 1668. He is doing in 628. So almost 1,000 years before he's doing that, right? So in 762, Baghdad city that we know today was founded in 762. And uh, they wanted to be the center of uh, world knowledge. And they created something called House of Wisdom, a center of learning. And they invited people from all over the world. All over the world they invited, right? So in 770, uh, eight years after that, uh, Kanka, he was a scholar in Ujjain. He was a scholar uh, of astronomy and mathematics, astronomy, not astrology, right? And uh, he was invited and he goes there and he introduces uh, the Hindu arithmetic and astronomy. Brahma's put uh, Siddhant was translated into Arabic and was named Sindh Hind. Siddhant became Sindh. And another translation of Indian astronomy uh, Alarkand, Alark is uh, the sun, Alarkand, uh, has also been translated from Suri Siddhanta. About 820, Al Khwarezmi writes the book of addition and subtraction according to the Hindu calculation. He writes this book 820, right? And uh, obviously, we don't have the original Arabic, but there are translations available which refer to this book. In 830, he writes the compendious book on calculation by completion and balancing. So this is more of an algebra. Right? And that, that's where we get the algebra uh, or algebra, the word also comes from. The first one is addition and subtraction, which is arithmetic. And the second one is algebra. These are big, huge uh, milestone works in, in world uh, mathematical history, history, right? So in 850, Mahavir, uh, he writes Ganita Sara Sangraha and uses unit fractions, combinatorics, and other fractions also. 900, Sridhar is the first mathematician to give the rules to solve a quadratic equation as we know it today. 900 uh, CE. 1120, uh, Edlard of Bath, he translates uh, Al Khwarizmi's book into Latin, which has survived. So, this is the introduction of uh, Indian maths uh, to Europe via uh, Arab world. 1150, Bhaskar writes Siddhanta Shiromani, which works on arithmetic, algebra, spheres, astronomy, advances, operations on zero concept of infinity, advances in permutation combination, first sure signs of differential calculation and Rolle's theorem. And I'm not making it up. This is, you know, very well uh, accepted and known, right? 12th century, 
European scholars traveled to Spain and Sicily seeking scientific Arabic texts, including Al Khwarezmi's previous book. 1202, Fibonacci publishes Liberabachi and introduces Indian numbers, and nobody takes it. Around 1400, back in India, Madhava of Kerala School of Mathematics gives what later will be called as Gregory series, Newton power series, McLean series, all these happening almost 200 to 300 years later. He's already giving all of them. One guy is giving all of them. And here are some of the, the Gregory series. Uh, and and you know, if you're inclined mathematically, the formulas are also given. So all these were, and this is proved now. This is not even extrapolation. This is not even like you know, self-pride or whatever. It's, it's clearly proved. Right. So in 1835, Charles Wish, he was the first person in modern times to realize that the Kerala mathematicians had done a wonderful job and they discovered calculus even earlier than Europeans by 300 years. It's not like three years, three centuries. Right. This is enough time uh, for knowledge to travel all over the world in three centuries. Right. So Wish's publication, uh, it was uh, unnoticed and uh, nobody even took care, not even the historians of maths even looked at it. Only 100 years later, back in 1940s, historian, mathematical historians, uh, they started looking at it and they found that, you know, what Wish said in 1835 is actually correct. Right. So I will skip on this one because I have a couple of other slides to uh, look. Here is one important, uh, interesting, uh, interesting observation. The Greeks, however, did not adopt a positional number system. It is worth thinking just how significant this fact is. The Greek mathematical achievements were based on geometry. Although Euclid's Elements contains a book on number theory, it is based on geometry. In other words, Greek mathematicians did not need to name their numbers since they worked with numbers as lengths of lines. Anyway. So let us look at, um, so what next? I mean, now that we know that, okay, we contributed uh, and all, so what do we do now? I mean, all the information that was discovered and all is now common knowledge. It's there in textbooks. Uh, so what do we want to do with it now? So one is that uh, if, if one has interest and if it is possible, uh, one can read the manuscripts uh, and try to see on their own if there are new insights to old problems. And these are now available. Right. IIT Bombay is also doing great work. IIT Madras is also doing great work. And then we can also get some self-respect. You know, we uh, as a civilization, as a country, uh, we have been uh, you know, infused with infinity complex that we can do nothing. We are nothing. We were nothing like that. And it is not so. So we should at least know uh, what all we were able to do and where did we lose it, that, that uh, scientific temperament. Where did we lose it? We should get it back from our own uh, roots, right? We can take inspirations from them, uh, like we take inspiration from Newton, Gauss, Einstein, or whatever. We can take inspiration from our own people, also, right? And then we can awaken, arise, and advance. And uh, if they could do it, then you can also do it. Right? So I think I'll stop here. Um, and uh, if there's any questions, I don't know what kind of questions uh, this might have. It's just pure facts. But if there are any questions, then uh, we can uh, take those also. Sir, uh, sir, sir uh, what led to the decline uh, of the like all the uh, mathematical knowledge and uh, uh, about the scientific knowledge that we have? Uh, what about them? What is the question? That, uh, what factors? Uh, oh, what factors led to the decline? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, we can make some, uh, you know. Uh, connecting the dots, so to speak, uh, that uh, there was a lot of uh, foreign invasion that happened in India. And you will see that uh, with that, you start seeing the decline in all knowledge systems. Uh, the whole library at Nalanda was burnt. So whatever knowledge we felt very sacred was memorized, and which was not very sacred was available in books also. right? So we lost a lot of uh, books and a lot of learned people during these uh, very, very troublesome times for the Indian uh, subcontinent. And you will see that Kerala mathematics was surviving much later because the, the uh, external factors started uh, up there in uh, Sindh, Punjab, Rajasthan, Haryana, that area first. 
So all the knowledge uh, systems or places or people of north went away first. We lost that first. So we still had Kerala mathematicians, but even after, you know, um, you will find that after that, they also could not continue forever. Right? They also just uh, dried up. So the invasion was one very big factor. Uh, we might want to be politically correct or whatever, but uh, this is, these are some facts that you cannot deny. And uh, so the, the environment was not conducive for scientific thinking anymore. Like that. That's my best guess. Shashi, Shashiji, if I may also yes. say, yes, I think it's also the uh, a few things that changed also. So one is also the fact of the Sanskrit language, the position of the Sanskrit language being reduced in society, especially post the colonial invasion. Yes. Uh, during Islamic, the, uh, the Mughal invasion and during that period, there still was, but again, they were uh, because of yes. the dominant and all, there was a, a, a preference over certain things, probably certain knowledge, traditions, etc. Right. Right. I think it's uh, with the British efforts to erase it from our memory. Yes, it is well documented, by the way, uh, yeah. not just the Macaulay thing. It's very well documented. We only hear about Macaulay. But there are wonderful uh, the annals of uh, British uh, this thing. They, they keep publishing these every six months or every month or whatever. This is like 1700s, 1800s. So we have books from that time which clearly have uh, recorded the discussions the policymakers in Britain had and how they implemented the policies. And there's nothing chest beating or whatever that, you know, the politicization of these statements happens. It's a very, very known fact that they said. So when the Britishers did the first survey, of education in India, they found that there were two types of schools, one which where the, the Persian was the main uh, language of teaching and the other one was Sanskrit was the main language of teaching. And these schools were open to everybody. And uh, interestingly, there were iron smiths, there was a dhobi who were teachers, not just students, who were teachers of uh, the, the mundane uh, knowledge, right? Not the esoteric knowledge, but the worldly knowledge like maths or uh, science or chemistry, or alchemy, these people were the actual ones who were doing. So they were even teachers and it is recorded. And they were girls also in these schools. And this is Britishers recording it. And then they said that the only way, and this is well documented, uh, if anybody is doubting that, you can search on uh, Google itself. So what they said was that if we need to get hold of their minds, we have to do something about this uh, the education. And education or the, the language is the carrier of the culture. So we need to remove these two languages from our support. We are not going to support them. They can have whatever they want. But the Britishers started their own English medium schools, started with Calcutta, and they offered the latest science and maths happening in Europe. So here we had a few centuries of no scientific temperament, just old commentaries and old stuff, just you know, keeping that alive, but nothing new. So they brought in this thing and they said, and, and there's a person also, uh, he predicted that Indians love knowledge. So give them the latest maths and science happenings in Europe. They will love it. They will come. And then we will manipulate. It's, it's clearly written, right? It's a four page uh, article uh, that talks about this in one of the Asiatic Society uh, journals from 1800s. So they introduced that and then we, uh, you know, the, the elites started going to these English schools and then following that everybody else also, okay, it's a great thing to be in English school. What we lost there was touch with our own language, our own way of thinking. That is very important. It's not uh, bad to take knowledge from anywhere else, right? I mean, obviously Europe was doing a lot of things. But if you lose touch with what you are and how you think and how you approach some things, then there's a problem. For example, even in medicine, I mean, the Western approach has always been, you know, individ individual systems, right? You, you break up things into parts and you learn each part and you will know. But we have always said everything is holistic. So if you, you know, break the car apart into tire, steering and the seat and all these things, you will never know what is a car. Only when you put them together, you will know. So we have had this approach to life, a holistic approach everywhere, even in maths, <laughs> even in, uh, you know, language or science or whatever. So that is uh, that is there. That happened systematically uh, for whatever reason. So at least we should realize whenever we can and uh, try to learn from whatever past we can learn. Sorry, 
extent uh, one more question uh, like it is uh, said that uh, during the uh, past certain time uh, like the uh, like the female uh, gender uh, would not uh, uh, like they they were not allowed to study so is it true or was it true uh, really in the past uh, uh, of our uh, indian culture i don't think i got the full question uh, they were allowed to study is it true that's all i got what was the question yes, sorry yes who were uh, allowed to study so the uh, so the girls like other women yeah 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 this is as early as the early 19th century before the crown took over when east india company was there they themselves did a survey of education in india and the reason for their reason was selfish they said we need to know the people we are interacting with and the east india company was getting good control of the land right i mean the kings and all they were defeating fighting the kings and defeating and getting actually political control as a as a company so they said that we need to know the people we are governing so we can govern them better you need to know your enemy better right so it was for that purpose they actually sponsored paid projects sending out people knowledgeable people with a uh, illustrator also artist going around so there is one guy who went four different trips he made he landed in madras he uh, went all the way to calcutta and then that was the first trip and then he did three more trips he was roaming around india noticing talking writing down jotting down and his uh, illustrator guy will illustrate oh i saw this temple i saw this cow i saw that whatever is marketplace and that is also very well uh, preserved so they themselves said that these are the things they were all today we say caste and all right all castes were studying students of all castes were there right so they themselves have done it so we, we don't have to believe our people we can at least believe there because they were doing the research for <clears throat> very specific reason so they won't lie right to themselves so they were not telling us they were telling their own people in english books <laughs> so yes it was true yes girls were also studying but the thing is it was not like today so today we have made it mandatory everybody has to go what is the requirement in that person's life so if a farmer is there what is the point of uh, learning about the structure of atom and chemistry and physics all the way up to there is no point that right? is a farmer so our education system was catered to the person's needs so some basic elements will be there and after that specific things are being studied by the individual so somebody if is an iron smith he does need to know about agriculture for example just a small exposure will be fine so he is studying something else uh, but basic stuff was there the language uh, maths and uh, you know basic uh, moral ethics or whatever that was common to everybody but beyond that people uh, students were learning on a need basis that is very important basic literacy was there but since we had an oral tradition even literacy was not very important education was important not literacy <laughs> that is the way we approach that sir and uh, if our people were smart and more knowledgeable uh, than the britishers then why uh, we couldn't uh, uh, understand that uh, they, uh, they had come to invade us and uh, why we got defeated like by them <laughs> good question so now we are going into a slightly different territory but i will uh, address that question uh, to whatever i uh, i have also thought about these things and all and uh, you will get uh, you know as many opinions or or simple like okay we are stupid that's why we lost right in a sense that is true that's the crux of the whole history that we are stupid so we lost but how did we become stupid that is also a question right so if you look at the warfare and the niti shastra which is the practical worldly wisdom and sanskrit literature the the largest uh, contribution in sanskrit literature is of niti shastra which is practical political governance administration that kind of uh, things is the largest amount like most written thing is uh, on niti shastra everywhere it is even in ramayana niti shastra is filled up mahabharata also niti shastra purana also niti everywhere niti shastra is always there and somewhere we lost it the other thing is that uh, earlier uh, in all our uh, well not all over but at least in india when armies fought they only fought the soldiers soldiers fought the soldiers that was always there there was never a problem to the civilians but the external uh, attacks that happened 
they were indiscriminate and india had never seen that they were not prepared for that they did not know somewhere somebody said that in india war was an art whereas in europe it was a science big difference so here we you know okay our soldier will fight we'll figure out who is the mightier one and then you pay taxes to me it was not like that when the foreigners were coming in they were killing anybody and everybody they made sure to kill the minds of the society it's it's recorded in history they, they made sure that the minds of the society once they are removed then the society becomes rudderless and easy to control and we have seen that in very recent history in bangladesh when when bangladesh was born in the early uh, 70s just before that that's what was happening the intelligent uh, the intelligentsia of uh, bangladesh was being removed uh, killed actually so that is uh, where i think we lost uh, we did not realize what the enemy was doing we i think got caught up in spirituality too much the king should not get caught up in spirituality they should be you know practical and all. maybe we also had some uh, you know over confidence maybe oh who can do anything to us like when alexander was coming the empire uh, the emperor of magadh uh, dhananand is uh, said to uh, have said to chanakya that uh, oh they can come and uh, you know whatever they do to the border states who cares if they come uh, to magadh then we'll teach them a lesson so chanakya says that there is not going to look at you know who were bodh because dhananand become bodh right he was a buddhist so chanakya says that they are not going to look at you as you are buddhist or whatever everybody here is an indian for them so they will not discriminate between two they'll kill everybody so that is where i think we lost that political edge that we had and uh, we are facing the consequences now i don't know if that answers your question but thank you sir good morning sir am i audible yeah yeah please sir today in the discussion one point came where it was told that there are five infinities so four mm-hmm. of them i could understand but what is perpetual infinity all about can you please <laughs> yeah yeah so i have not gone into the details because uh, one is that uh, even if it is ancient math it can become uh, very you know detail oriented so i have skipped that but you can look at jain mathematics uh, you can do some research on the internet it's all available uh, so i didn't okay. want to make it too technical you know it's a <clears throat> sir uh, i would like to continue on the previous note that the discussion which was uh, just going on it's okay. regarding the britishers introducing the western culture or the western education system in our country so we indians why did we accept it and why didn't we raise our voice at that point of time <laughs> so uh, okay so we are drifting the scope that's fine uh, just uh, whoever has time can hang around i think you guys have some other classes also so this is well documented and uh, uh, what was documented was see at the it all started before the crown took over so it was still east india company there were still kings who were mm-hmm. not under the east india company right so but the areas for example bengal was under east india company so they said and uh, you know macaulay comes actually a little later when he says that we need clerks and all and uh, this is all uh, documented by them themselves so what they said was that you cannot force uh, all these things on these people so how will you do it and i mentioned that there was a colonel who uh, army guy who visited india only once and he said that what the heck are you guys doing why are you giving uh, this financial support to schools that are teaching in sanskrit and persian because th- those were the schools of the of the locals right of the indians so they said no no we are doing it as a csr like you know corporate uh, social responsibility we give some donation to these schools so that we are in good books of the locals so he said that you are wasting your money he said you should have and this is the guy who said that you know these guys love knowledge give them knowledge because a lot of new knowledge is coming out of europe which was true so give them that they will come for that and then you can teach them anything else so they included bible studies they included conversion all this stuff they included in the education system itself as a side note okay so they were very um, uh, shrewd in their planning and we can't blame them they were bad we were stupid also right so i agree on that one and what happened in bengal bengal was priding itself on this intellectual intellectualism and you know we are the smartest people and all that stuff and kharagpur is also in bengal so and i have been there so it is close to me also 
But what happened was they did not realize what this new step was doing. They joined, they sent their kids to these schools, they learned new scientific and mathematical stuff, and they were thrilled. They discussed like crazy, right? We all love to discuss funda as we speak, right? <laughs> the gyan, the funda. That was the hook. So you can trap or entice a good guy and a bad guy. The ways will be different. So the good guy you entice with, hey, I'll give you knowledge. Let's, let's come and discuss knowledge. And that's how they came in. It was not compulsory to go to the English schools. But if you went to English schools, then you would get a job in the company, in the, the company, like the East India Company, right? So that was also there. And then uh, there are always ways, uh, and that topic becomes big. Uh, the Niti Shastra, and it was not something that we Indians did not know what is Niti Shastra, what are shrewd people. We knew very well. Chanakya also says that. Uh, Ramayana may also, there's a whole chapters of Niti. Mahabharata has entire Vidur Niti and a lot of other sections of Niti. And a lot of them, other like Panchatantra and Mahabharata uh, and uh, Hitopadesh, they have great Niti. They tell you, how do you identify a bad person? And our own folks forgot our own scriptures, our own uh, wisdom to realize who is doing what to you. That was the biggest fall in my opinion, that we did not realize what is this new education kind of school or whatever is doing. Take the good from it, no, no problem. Yeah, Europe is making great strides. Take it, learn it, but don't lose your own identity. That is the main point. Once you lose your identity, you are like a rudderless boat, right? Anybody can take you anywhere. I think that's where we missed out. Okay, thank you, sir. Sure. Anuradhaji, any other uh, questions we have? Or I think students have uh, class also, right? I have left already. So does anybody have any other question? Or we oh, can, they uh, left already. Okay, let me at least stop yes. presenting them. No? <laughs> okay. So then I can also see how many people are there. Or some chat no, is also. MS Teams is quite difficult to, you know, find this. Okay, there we aren't many, so I think we can close at this stage. Sure. Because they all have classes to attend. Okay, I see there are 19 in, still in the thing. Yeah, so any, I, I'm fine. I mean, uh, yeah, I think I said, like I said, so a few people, yes. a few people have been asking for your the PPT, which of course you will provide. And I was just also wanting to request you to share, let's say, the document that you spoke about where the British are, you know, that uh, to yes, document. I'll it will yeah. be great for them to actually, uh, you know, have access to these yes. original archival yes, documents yes. Yes, to yes. know that there is, uh, you know, just a sample of many other things. Yes. So, yeah, I think it's one of important for students at least to know the truth one and to feel inspired. You should know the reality what happened. I mean, there's no point cribbing about the past that, oh, we lost, we lost. Yeah, we lost. Find out why we lost. What can we do? And what did we have that we can take forward, right? And it is not just facts, it is attitude also that we should look at that. What did we have? What was our attitude, right? So that way. Sure, I'll, I'll send uh, the, the supporting documents and links. Yes, you can, you can either share it with me and all or even directly put it, upload it here if that is I'll allowed. share it with you and then you can put it away because I don't know where to put <laughs> I don't want to make a mistake. <laughs> yes, please sure. do that. So, yes, so thank you very much. Just one thing that uh, St. Andrews is also my alma mater. I did a course. Oh, <laughs> small world. <laughs> it's interesting that they have all these documents. I don't know if we have in Indian universities or Indian institutions of high, like for example, in IIT. Mm -hmm. Do we have a record like this is a question. Right. You know, that is what... St. Andrew's uh, Mathematics Department website has provided beautiful information. I mean, such detailed stuff they have provided that, uh, and so people have actually sat down and studied those works. Mathematicians with Sanskrit scholars sitting down studying and actually appreciating, like, wow, this was there. And so, I mean, I didn't find any other website as passionate about Indian mathematicians. <laughs> they have other mathematician history also, the history of all uh, civilizations and all. But uh, nowhere I've seen, you know, so much information and passion about uh, an appreciation for Indian mathematicians. So that's wonderful. I'll send you the that's, links. No, that's what I'm saying, that it's unfortunate that, oh, that we have been there in our uh, higher institutions of learning. I think Jit has a question. Yes, Jit? Yes, Jit. 
Sir, uh, since we are talking about currencies today, so uh, there was a barter system also in the history of our culture. So, uh, did that exist in the Harappan civilization? Barter system that means we exchange goods in right, uh, right. goods. Yes. So, I think barter system has been all over the world, right? Because nobody was born with currency. But I think barter system became a problem. For example, today if you want to buy a laptop and uh, you have a farm so you say i uh, you know i have a wheat farm i can pay you in wheat and then this 60000 rupees uh, laptop can you imagine 60000 rupees worth of wheat you carry to the shop so that was a natural uh, you know as commerce increased uh, the currency had to come in and currency earlier was just the precious metals uh, because you don't have enough of that nobody made uh, just iron lumps into currency Earlier it was gold and silver because you don't find that much, and uh, later on it became stamped uh, coins. So whether it was Chandragupta time or uh, Harappan time, there were seals, right, or or any material made, but a special stamp put which cannot be duplicated. So main thing in currency is you can't duplicate easily. So uh, Harappan civilization also would have you know done barter system at some point of time. For example, Mehargad. Which is uh, you know 8,500 years from now, from today. So they would have had some barter system, right? They didn't have. In, uh, and remember also that uh, all economies were local economies all over the world, right? In India, especially, you know, uh, that five villages were sufficient for all regular needs of people. That was the the development model. That within five nearby villages, you should get everything of your normal requirements. Only exotic fragrance or some exotic silk that you get from foreign lands is the only thing <laughs> that you have to do. So yes, barter system was there everywhere. Okay, thank you, sir. Sure. Uh, so I think Shashiji, I think that's good. I think. You know, <laughs> sure. Thank you very much, Dhanyavada, oh. for uh, hey. giving Dhanyavada. the time to talk with the students and enthuse them basically. I but, hope somebody, uh, somebody was awake. I hope <laughs> not everybody slept off or something. And if I was able to spark any, uh, you know, ignite any sparks, uh, my mission is done. Uh, please continue this in your own private way. It's very interesting. No matter which field you are in, uh, there's a lot that we have done. Yeah, no, I think I wanted to share your website. Uh, your website. Yes, okay, I'll send you. Yeah, I'll send you the details. I'll yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Naraji. Okay. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you.